Good afternoon. I'm Ben Greenman. Today is December 23rd, 2020, and I'm here to make a recording of my defense talk, which took place last week on December 17th. First, for the record, I've been a student at Northeastern University in Boston studying programming languages for the past six and a half years. My advisor was Matthias Falaisen, and my dissertation committee was Amal Ahmed, Jan Vitek, Shriram Krishnamurthy, Fritz Henglein, and Sam Tobin-Hopstadt. So thank you all very much, advisor and committee. The title of my dissertation is Deep and Shallow Types. You may have heard great minds think alike. Now here's an example that's a little closer to home in programming languages. One of the early pioneers, Andre Urshov, was at a conference one day and he shared a new idea he had with a colleague. And the colleague pulled out a memo that had roughly the same idea already written up. Urshav's wisdom was to not be disappointed in this, but to take it as a compliment. He said, if two people on other sides of the world come up with the same idea, then there must be something really important sitting underneath there. So with that in mind, one of the great modern ideas in programming languages is this thought of mixing typed and untyped code in the same language. Instead of two people on other sides of the world coming up with the idea, we had four research groups in 2006, and they all independently published papers getting at the same mixed-typed idea. First, here are the basics. Uh, typed code comes with a meta-language. Those are the types. And in order to run a program, you need to first prove that the types are correct. If you can do so, though, then when you finally run the code, you have stronger guarantees about what it's going to do. Untyped code comes with no meta-language, so that means you have more freedom to test out new designs, but also more freedom to make mistakes. And the mixed typed idea is to combine the best of both worlds in one way or another. And we'll see the central question in this area is what happens at the runtime boundaries between typed and untyped? When these two sides communicate, what, what should happen? Here's an example to think about. On the left, we have untyped code that calls a function f with a, a letter a as the input. And we see on the right, function f is defined in typed code and expects a number. So the boundary question is, does that static type number keep out bad inputs like the letter A? We have our four originals. And again, these came out in 2006. And since then, there's been a huge amount of work in this area. So to give credit where it's due, there are some older implementation ideas as well, dating back, I think, to Mac Lisp in the 1970s. But lately, it's been an explosion. We have over. 200 publications, which is just enormous for programming languages. And so there's a lot of interest in this area. A lot of people recognize this mixed type idea as an important one. If we look at the research space in terms of our central question, what happens at the boundaries, then we can compress things a bit. Instead of 200 different ideas, it's really about six, plus or minus, six different ideas for what to do at the boundaries. Still, that's a lot of variety. Now, in addition to all the research ideas, we fortunately have many implementations of the mixed type idea. Some come from academic research groups and others come from industrial teams, but either way, there are many languages out there where you can test, you can write some typed code, write some untyped code, and run it and see what happens. All told, this is the mixed type design space. With these implementations in mind, we can go back to our first example. We asked whether that static type num on the right keeps out the letter A that's coming in on the left. And if we run this example in the different languages, we see a split. In some of these, the answer is yes. That type num is a runtime check, or it's enforced later on with a runtime check, and that keeps out bad inputs. Other languages, though, say no. The type has no effect when we run the program. If we focus just on the languages that said yes to our first question, we'll find they still disagree if we go to a larger question. Here on the left, untyped code makes an anonymous function with lambda, and this function computes a letter. In the center, we see that our untyped function goes into a typed f, which is expecting a function that computes a number. But our typed code in the middle doesn't call the function directly. Instead, it sends it over to untyped code further over on the right, which we'll say eventually calls the function. Now the question is whether that type claim, arrow num, detects the bad function later on when it's finally called. Again, in some languages, the answer is yes, that this type obligation is enforced. Other languages say no. So in response to our central question of what happens at the boundaries, 
we see a big variety of answers. Some languages check nothing, others check as much as possible, and there's a wide variety of things in between. If you press further and ask a language designer or a researcher, why did you go for this answer over another one, one thing is loud and clear. There's a performance cost to enforcing these types, and that influences the choices. But if you keep pressing and ask where's the data that justified the choice, there's not much to see. We study the research papers, you'll often see performance for fully untyped and fully typed, but very little on what happens in between when typed and untyped is actually mixed. So we see this whole design space is, there's a lot of activity which is terrific, but it's not so organized. We like to think of science as giants standing on one another's shoulders. But what we really have is more like the blind people touching an elephant. There's a great idea sitting in here, and that's this mixed typed idea. But what we're lacking is direction about where to go next. And then once we have an implementation or a research idea that's gone off a certain direction, we're lacking methods to evaluate how it's succeeded or failed. This is where I come in. So my research for the past six years has been bringing order to both sides of the design space. I've been developing formal properties to assess what types mean at the boundary, and also developed a first systematic method to measure performance in an implementation. So I'll tell you about these two research contributions today. We'll see that the performance work outlines a problem. Your performance is definitely trouble if you want strong guarantees. And then the second leg of research tells us what's the space of possible solutions that we can use to mitigate the problem. If these two together would come in a natural thesis statement, and here's a preview of what's coming up next. We'll I will show that two points in the solution space, called deep types and shallow types, these can mix together, and there's good reason to do so. But first, let's study performance. Our story begins with Typed Racket, which is one of those four 2006 originals. What you need to know is that Typed Racket does its very best to enforce types. It tries to give the strongest possible guarantees. And Typed Racket is also the home of major performance costs. You can see those costs if you look at the top of the Array library. So this is a built-in math library that ships with Typed Racket. And you see a performance warning at the top. It says, beware. If you're trying to use arrays from untyped code, you could see slowdowns of 25x to 50x. So this is one mature library, and it's saying, look, we're stuck for now. We have a high performance cost when you talk about these boundaries. You can also see costs if you browse the mailing lists. So here's an older question from John Clements, and John had written a tiny script that you see sketched on the left here. He calls a, a library for try data structures, makes a simple try, and then does a certain operation on it. Now running his little script took about 12 seconds. That seemed high, so John converted it over to typed racket by switching the language line and adding annotations. Now running exactly the same code with the types took one millisecond. So this is a huge gap between the typed performance and the untyped. And his question was, should there just be a warning at the top of the try functions? But again, we see there are high costs. The question, though, back in 2014, was whether or not these costs were widespread. We knew that there were pitfalls, but it wasn't clear if there was a language bug somewhere, or maybe there's just certain design patterns to avoid. If these performance troubles are few and far between, then maybe we can, we can avoid them without huge changes to the language. But what we lacked was a method to measure. So this is where myself and my collaborators came in. We developed a method to systematically measure performance. In particular, I need to acknowledge Asumu Takikawa. Who, he's the one who really started measuring performance, and then we worked together to develop it into the comprehensive thing that we have today. And our other collaborators, who also helped you know, in many ways, Max New, Dan Felty, Jan Vitek, and Matthias Felizen. Okay, step one was to collect benchmarks. Uh, the six, six of us searched everywhere that we could to find small and useful programs. So we wanted to avoid the typical micro-benchmark case. Each of our benchmarks has at least two modules that work together. And then ideally we wanted standalone programs that someone had independently created to do a useful task. And then we were going to explore what's the effect of adding types on this code that somebody already thinks is useful code. Right, and that was step 1.5 of the benchmark collection. Once we have a code base, 
If it's typed, then we're all set. We can make an untyped version fairly easily. If it's untyped, then we need to develop full type annotations for it. So we did that and came up with a suite of 21 programs. And here's one example called JPEG. Now this comes from an image processing library. And you can see in the screenshot the original author, the original source, and then some things about the modules that are inside and how they fit together. Uh, the important thing here is that JPEG comes with five migratable modules and two contextual modules. So these are shown in the plot, shown in the figure, as circles for migratable and square for contextual. And the difference is those migratable modules are what the original author wrote. That's what he has control over. And that's the things that we're going to experiment adding types to. The contextual modules are important libraries that we depend on. But they're not things that are easy to switch between typed and untyped. So they fall outside of the experiment. But they still have a they still matter for performance, that's why they're acknowledged. And I want to say this screenshot comes from the racket documentation. If you search for the GTP benchmarks, then you can see all the all the benchmarks that we put together. Once we collected the benchmarks, step two is how to measure the performance. What to measure is fairly clear. We need to look at all possibilities because we don't know where a programmer is going to end up. If you have a program with three components or three modules, then that means there are two to the three configurations to study. And similarly, if we have a slightly larger program with six components, that means there are 64 or two to the six configurations that we need to look at. So again, what to measure is fairly clear. But now you can start to see that we have a size problem. So even in the case where we can measure all exponential number of configurations in the lattice, it's not so clear how do we compress that into a, into a lesson? How do we summarize the performance things that we found? And the second related question is how do we scale this method? So once we're talking about 20 modules, that's a million things to measure. 30 modules is a billion and we can't, we can't collect exhaustive data in that point. So we need a method that we can scale up. Now the beautiful insight is that for both questions, the answer was to focus on the bottom line of what, what happens at the end of the day to the programmer. Here's a cartoon of the programmer. We start off in the beginning with totally untyped baseline, and we're content with that. Now we start adding types to parts of the program, and things might, might not go so well. So now we have a partially typed program in the middle, and our developer is no longer smiling. He, he's nervous or shocked. But then at the top, once almost every module is typed, we see he's quite happy again. He's happier than he was before. So what's going on here? Sitting behind these emotions, we're looking at overhead relative to untyped. In the beginning, the baseline is just fine. So untyped is 1x, and we're happy with that in the beginning. Then the question is, as we add types to different parts of the code base, what's the overhead relative to what we had originally? If the overhead is much higher, we're not happy. If the overhead is lower, then we're very happy. That means types are speeding things up. So we turn this cartoon of the programmer into a the central part of the analysis. We introduce a parameter D, and the question is to look at the number of D deliverable configurations across a lattice. So you as the user fill in D with what is too much overhead. Right? What's, the, what's the most that you're willing to accept? If you can tolerate a 4x slowdown, then your four deliverable configurations are the ones that run at most four times slower than untyped. Here's a small example lattice on the right. I've grayed out the configurations that run over the 4x limit. And now with that in mind, once we've instantiated d equals 4, we can see that half the lattice is usable. Half the lattice runs within the requirement. And so now we've turned that exponential space into a single number. So that is how we uh, compress the lessons from an exhaustive data set down into one number. And a similar technique lets us deal with these huge lattices where we can't measure every point. The insight is that whether or not one configuration is four deliverable is a yes or no question. So if we pick one configuration at random, what we have is a Bernoulli random variable. It's a kind of coin flip. So if we take a sample of a bunch of these randomly selected configurations, then we can use the percent of dedeliverable configurations across the sample to make a prediction about the full space. And what we found in our studies is that a linear number of samples offers an accurate prediction.
Step three of the method is to summarize the data set with a picture. So here's the data for one benchmark in our suite titled Quad U. What you're looking at is the green area. A larger area means better performance. On the x-axis, we have a range of D. So instead of looking at just 4x deliverable or 2x deliverable, we have a full range going from 1x to 20x was the absolute worst that we considered. On the y-axis, you see the percent of deliverable configurations. So the goal would be to have uh, a high proportion. Lots of configurations are, say, one deliverable or two deliverable. And then ideally, as you go up towards the right, any of the stragglers also become deliverable if you can tolerate a slightly higher overhead. In this benchmark, that's not the case. But the point of the picture is we can see that all at once. And uh, quad is a benchmark that we have full exhaustive data for. So this is one that we also use to validate the sampling method. So now, on top of that orange line for the truth, here's a, on top of the green line for the truth, we have an orange interval, and that's the result of sampling. We took 10 samples with a linear number of configurations in each sample. Across those 10, we develop a confidence interval for the true proportion of D deliverable configurations for every D along the x-axis. And as you can see, this is good news for sampling. The orange interval covers the green true line, and it's fairly tight. So we have accurate and precise measurements coming out of the samples here. So all told, step one, two, three, that's our method for evaluating performance. First, collect benchmarks and make sure that you have fully typed and fully untyped versions of each. Second, use this notion of de-deliverable configuration to draw lessons from the data set. And then finally, these overhead plots are a concise way to see the results across several benchmarks. This method has been applied to several languages, uh, both by us and then by other researchers. I want to focus on two applications in particular today, one for typed racket and one for reticulated Python. And these were done in addition to our original conspirators. We brought in Sam tobin Hotchdot and Robbie Findler to help with type cracking, and Zena Magid helped very much with reticulate. But now let's see the results. For type cracking, again, we used those 21 benchmarks that we developed. Here are four typical plots. These results are not very good. If you're willing to tolerate a 2x slowdown, then at most half of your configurations are too deliverable. So that means the other half of the space, and usually more, is totally off limits for you if you can't tolerate a higher slowdown. And then even if you're extremely generous and you're willing to wait for a 20x overhead, you still can use at best half the configurations. So these results are pretty grim. Type Racket clearly has some widespread performance issues in these benchmarks. Application number two for reticulated Python. We used completely different benchmarks from prior work on reticulated, but we used the same method to evaluate performance. And the results of the method are quite different. It's night and day. If you're willing to tolerate a 4x slowdown in reticulated, then you can usually use most of the configurations in the lattice. If you're willing to go up to 10x, we found that that made everything deliverable. Every configuration across all of the benchmarks was 10 deliverable. Again, keep in mind, it's a totally different language and totally different benchmarks, but this seems much better than the situation in typed racket. Which begs the question, is reticulated just a better implementation of the mixed typed idea than typed racket was? What is going on here that makes these two performance results so different? To answer this question, we need to go up and instead of just looking at performance in the implementation, let's formally compare the two semantics that lie underneath. So behind typed racket, there's something called the natural semantics. And behind reticulated, we have the transient semantics. By studying these two semantics, we can look at formal guarantees. Maybe there's a difference among formal properties, and that explains what we're seeing in performance. Well, fortunately, there are some well-known properties in the literature. We have several papers on gradual typing, migratory typing, mixed type languages, focus on type soundness, the gradual guarantee, and the blame theorem, and use these ideas to evaluate designs. So let's see what these properties have to say about natural and transient. And what a surprise! They all say natural and transient both satisfy all three properties. 
So natural and transient are indistinguishable. If we go further though, and go back to our example where we send it, we started with an untyped function that computes a letter, and we put it against the type that says, I expect a number coming out. We asked before whether or not implementations accept this, this program, or really, does that type, arrow num, catch the function when it finally returns a letter? It turns out natural and transient disagree. Natural says yes, that type is an obligation that's enforced and it does catch the letter when it comes out. Transient says no. So we have a difference here. And this distinction that shows up in our small example just gets worse if we consider a larger program. Here's one such bigger example. Our programmer at the top has just written an untyped, untyped bit of code at the top left. Now, the programmer's goal is to count the number of lines in a file. And to do this, he's calling a typed function tfoldfile. In order to develop this untyped code, our programmer has looked at the type sitting at the top right. Just like the type expects, the programmer passes in a file path as the first argument, an initial number accumulator as the second argument, and a callback function count as the third argument. And count expects a number first for the running total, and then a string representing the next line in the file. Every time count gets called, our untyped programmer adds one to the running total, and in the end we should have a count for the right number of lines. If we run this program using the transient semantics, we get a surprise. Instead of counting the number of lines, we see an error due to plus, which says it got bad input. To see what's going on, we have to dig further. So go beyond the types that we have here. We see that the typed API in the top right is actually just a wrapper on top of an untyped library. And it turns out the type is an incorrect claim about the library. Down underneath, our untyped library passes in function passes the arguments in the opposite order to our callback function. Instead of the accumulator number first and the string second, it does the string first. So that's, that's what's going on. That's the source of the error. But we see uh, the types didn't help our programmer predict what was going to happen. The question raised by this example is whether our API types protect the untyped callback that gets passed in from our untyped client over to the untyped library at the bottom. In the transient semantics, the answer is no. Those types do not protect the callback. And the rationale is that in the end, we have untyped to untyped communication. It's an untyped callback, count, and it's being called in an untyped context. Both of these are untyped. There's no static type sitting right there. So there's no obligation for the, any type to check anything. The natural semantics, though, takes a different perspective. In natural, the types do protect the callback. And the idea is the callback got to the untyped library by going through this typed layer. So those type claims need to be checked when untyped finally calls it. And if you run the same program in natural, you'll see an error at the boundary that says, hey, I expected a number as the first argument. Instead, I got a string. So stop here and programmer, please inspect the type claim and maybe inspect the library to see where the mismatch is. So this is a serious difference. But as we've seen, the formal properties don't distinguish natural and transient. We need a way to measure what are the guarantees that types are giving us at the boundary between these two worlds. And this is what motivated the second, second major research contribution here. How do we assess type guarantees? This was joint work with Christos Demoulis and Matthias Felizen. And we were interested when we started not just in natural and transient, but in the whole research design space. So I said before, we have about six different ways of enforcing types at the boundary. Now these all have six different names up at the top. In the beginning, type soundness does distinguish part of the space. So you can tell apart designs that care about the types in some way versus another semantics called erasure, where the types are only for type checking. So an erasure types have no runtime checks to enforce them. And this fails to satisfy a typical type soundness theorem. Okay, that's, that's the colors in the space that we have at the start, but we want to distinguish all these other stars up there. Our major contribution was to add a property called complete monitoring, and this separates the two points that we see on the left. Complete monitoring asks whether or not types guard all the communications that occur in a program. 
So as we have things going back and forth, and in particular higher order values going back and forth, complete monitoring tests where the type system is in control of all the communications that happen, first through the static channels, but also through the derived channels that come about through these higher order values. We can see the difference between complete monitoring and type soundness if we go back to our first example. Back to the example we just saw. The question was whether those API types at the top right protect the untyped callback that gets passed into the untyped library. The type soundness perspective is that no. The types sitting in the API do not imply that the callback is going to be protected. Type soundness is under no obligation to put a check between the, the boundary that shows up because this is an untyped to untyped channel of communication. And complete monitoring, on the other hand, says, look, this channel on the bottom left, it occurred through a typed API. So those types need to be there to guard the channel. So if your language satisfies complete monitoring, you can trust that the types monitor all communications. Now with this distinction, complete monitoring and type soundness, I can explain deep and shallow. Deep types are what satisfy complete monitoring. That's our name for those. Uh, deep is the spec, and complete monitoring is one formal property that captures it. Shallow types are type sound, but may not guarantee anything more. And uh, one way to look at it is type soundness guarantees local reasoning about the types. Uh, the types that, sit, that are sitting right there, uh, as you look at a line of statically typed code, you can trust those in a sound language. But you can't reason compositionally in a sound language. You need complete monitoring for that. What I mean is, if typed code communicates with untyped and things go across boundaries, maybe out and in to a different typed module, complete monitoring is the property that says those types are fully enforced. Type soundness is only local, but complete monitoring guarantees the composition. But, OK, we've seen complete monitoring added some color to the space but we went much further with three additional properties. One thing that complete monitoring guarantees is that your language will catch all mismatches that happen between a type sitting at a boundary and a value that comes across. But now, whether or not your language catches all these mismatches, you can ask what's the quality of error that we get if it does detect. So when a boundary error occurs, what, what has happened? Some value has gone across one or maybe more boundaries, and now we finally see something went wrong. The programmer needs to know what are the responsible boundaries. And so it's up to a language to suggest a set, and using formal properties, we can validate whether or not that set gets at the truly responsible parties or not. So our first property, blame soundness, asks whether you got a subset of the true boundaries. So a language that satisfies blame soundness, if it reports a set of these boundaries at one of the errors, you're guaranteed that that set is a subset of the, the truly responsible ones. So another way of saying this is that errors are accurate. Uh, if you receive one boundary from one of these errors, you can go look at that and you're likely to find something that went wrong in the program. Our second property is blame completeness, and this is a coverage property. If your language blames a set of boundaries, you're guaranteed if it's blame complete. That, that's a superset of all the possible places where something went wrong. There may be some extra noise or some irrelevant things in the set, but you're guaranteed at least the ones that are responsible. And the final property that we introduced is an error preorder relation. And this lets us compare semantics that raise an, er an error earlier than other ones. Early versus late checks. Now, all told, with these properties together, we have a much richer picture of the design space. Whereas before, we had a table with three rows and the table failed to distinguish natural and transient. Now we have a much clearer picture of what's going on. I'll come back to this table at the end. But now I've told you the two, two major contributions in the first four years of my PhD work. How do we assess type guarantees and how do we measure performance? Now it's time to talk about how to solve the performance problem. So our goal is a mixed type code that has strong guarantees. And the problem is these guarantees have a cost. So what can possibly be done? There are three research area, three directions worth exploring. Number one, we could design a new language that's mixed from the start that somehow uses new invariants or new designs to lower the cost of boundaries. Option two is to take a language that we already have and build a totally new compiler. Maybe JIT, JIT technology can lower the cost of these checks. 
Option three is to improve the existing compiler. My choice is to go ahead with option three, so I'll tell you all about that. If you're interested in option one, take a look at NAM and GRIFT. These are two interesting gradual from the start languages. If you're interested in option two, take a look at Picket after this talk. Picket is a JIT compiler for typed racket, and it's got very impressive performance results. Now, I've gone with option three, and so the constraints behind my work are that we're going to reuse the same type system that we have, and the idea is to add a new semantics on top of that, and we use this combination to get better performance. Now I can tell you my full thesis statement, and it's that deep type and shallow types can interoperate, preserving the formal properties that they had. So even with the mix, the deep types remain deep and the shallow types remain shallow. Furthermore, programmers can use these types to strengthen your shallow guarantees, avoid errors that occur in deep code that you're maybe not concerned about at the moment, and above all, to improve performance. Now we are trekking into new ground. These are results that you won't see any place else except the talk and the dissertation. Okay, we're going to take one representative from the deep space and one representative from the shallow space. As you might have guessed, we're going to combine natural and transient. So step one of dissertation work is to combine these two semantics into a new model and then to prove that it satisfies the expected properties. Step two is to use the model to inform the design of a new language. For the implementation work, we're going to extend typed racket. So typed racket already has deep types with the natural semantics and the task is to add shallow types. A few words on the model. We have a surface syntax, which lets us have some basic values, variables x, numbers i, pairs, and functions. So these, these simple data types are the things that can go across the boundary when we run the program. We also have some elimination forms to use these values. And we have a module expression, which lets us link the different kinds of languages that we're interested in. Our types include naturals and integers, Naturals are a subset of the integers, so we can talk about a subtyping relationship. And we also have types for pairs and types for functions. L is our languages, deep, shallow, and untyped. So by using these module expressions, we can make one big expression that has components that exercise the different typing disciplines. Now from this declarative surface syntax, the question is, what do we do with the boundaries? What kinds of checks do we need to ensure the properties? And what's the minimum checks that we can get away with? In the end, we wound up with three kinds of runtime check. And this is the configuration that works out. We have wrap, scan, and no op. A wrap check is either a full check for first order data. So a wrap will check a number that comes in. Or if a pair comes in, a wrap will traverse both elements of the pair. And if a higher order value comes in, such as a function, wrap creates a wrapper that'll later on enforce the behavior of the function. A scan boundary is a top-level shape check. So a scan enforces a top-level type constructor. And a no-off checks nothing. So our design is for any boundary that involves deep types to have a full wrap or a full check. And then any input that goes to shallow code needs to be validated by a scan. And otherwise, we can get away with a no-op. So we use the model as a test bed to wind up at this configuration. And with that, we're able to prove the properties that we're interested in. So both deep types and shallow types satisfy a soundness guarantee. And only the deep types satisfy complete monitoring. With that, the, the model is a mission accomplished. We move on now to the implementation. So we're extending typed racket. Here are the four main stages in the typed racket compiler. Surface code gets expanded down to a kernel syntax. The kernel language gets type checked. If the program is type correct, the next step is to generate contracts at the boundary to protect those deep types that go out. These contracts enforce the wrappers that we just talked about. And then the final main step in the compiler is to optimize well-typed code. So here, type soundness lets us justify program transformations so that the resulting program is more efficient. We're adding to deep type racket a new language called shallow racket. Shallow can reuse the same expander and the same type checker. So if your program type checked to a four, it still type checks afterwards in shallow racket. Step three of the compiler is totally different. 
So instead of generating deep contracts, we need to rewrite all type code to have quick top level shape checks. And then for step four, we're able to reuse some of the optimizations, but not all of them. Yep. Any optimization that only depends on shallow types is safe to reuse. Other ones that go deeper have to be turned off. The main part of step three, inserting the checks, is a question about how do we turn a static type into a runtime shape check. And my design choice was to enforce fold constructors as much as possible. So if you study the research on transient, you get the idea that every shape check should be a constant time test. That's not actually true in the implementation of reticulated, and it's certainly not true for us. So there's a question here about what do we want to detect and what's the performance cost of doing it. But I'm telling you at the start, uh, my decision was to enforce full constructors, and we'll look at the consequences in a minute. To give you a sense of what it means, this table shows static types on the left and the shape check for each type on the right. So for a simple type like number, the shape check is straightforward. You test with a basic racket predicate. For lists, we have an interesting choice because the runtime check, list huh, is potentially going to examine a sequence of pairs. So the list check is not necessarily constant time. It could be linear in the size of the incoming value. But fortunately in Racket, list is an amortized check. So once you've asked it once for a certain list, that, that result is cached, so you can use it going forward. For a union type, there's no way that we can do a constant time check. We need to check every alternative of the union. So that's shown on the right with this OR. We check both branches. And lastly, we have a function which expects one number and returns a number. The shape check guarantees that we have a function coming in, and it also tests whether that function accepts uh, one argument. So this, this last row shows you an example of a full type constructor. All right, and then in pass four, the optimizer. Type Racket comes with these 14 optimization topics. And again, it uses these to transform type sound code into something more efficient. The question is whether each pass uses deep type information or if it only depends on shallow parts of the type. Surprisingly, we can reuse all but two passes. Dead code is totally unsafe. It depends on too much of the type. And parts of the pair pass are unsafe. Parts of those depend on deep properties. But all the rest can be reused in the shallow compiler. Okay, we've seen the model, we've seen parts of the implementation, now we can go on to the benefits, the evaluation. So I have three claims that we need to look at. First is that moving from shallow to deep can give you stronger guarantees. And indeed, we get exactly that on our favorite example. If we have an untyped client talking to an untyped library through a shallow API, then there's no guarantee, there's no check. There's no check that protects the callback here for shallow types. But by switching from shallow to deep, you do get the check. NumString is on the boundary. So a stronger guarantee is because deep types satisfy complete monitoring. And yes, in general, deep types protect all boundaries. So you can trust those types. You can take your deep types to the bank. Second claim is that moving from deep to shallow can avoid unimportant errors. We can see examples of this if we go to the racket mailing list again. So here's a question from a few years ago. Our programmer had code that looked more or less like this. On the left, we have a deep module that defines a box, which is a mutable cell, gives that box the type any, and then sends it off to untyped code on the right. The untyped code tries to write a new value to the box. And the mailing list question was, well, I expected this program to work because it's a box with a number inside, and I wanted to write a new number. But when I run the program, I get this very strange error, technical error that says, well, the rationale behind it is that the box went across the boundary at type any. So the type racket conservatively needs to rule out all behaviors to make sure that this is safe. If you switch to shallow types, though, this program runs just fine, as expected. And remember that shallow is still type sound. So that means if untyped code were to write a bad value to the box, and then we later on read from the box in shallow code, well, that read later on is going to be protected with its own shape check. So that's how things work out. So we've seen lots of examples on the list uh, where shallow does exactly what the question asker had expected, 
And in general, I'm happy to report that Shallow can run almost all code that type checks. There are just a few examples, uh, and these are cases where deep code can't deep can't run the program either. Switching to Shallow also can't run it, but in general, Shallow improves expressiveness. Now our third claim is about performance. Here's the smallest benchmark in the suite. This one has two modules. When both are untyped, it runs in about two seconds. When we mix typed and untyped, if we're mixing untyped and deep, the same program runs in about 13 seconds, so it's much slower. If we're mixing untyped and shallow, then it runs in four seconds. So mixing typed and untyped, shallow seems to win. Or shallow certainly wins on this program. If the program is fully typed though, then deep is the best off. And the reason is that deep has no boundaries that it needs to check at runtime, and so it gets the full benefit of optimizations. Shallow, on the other hand, still has those spot checks on every line of code. So in the middle, shallow is the better choice. At the top, deep is the best. We can use the same plots as before and compare shallow and deep side by side. Here's our quad benchmark. The dark green area is what we saw earlier on in this presentation, and that's that's the percent of de-deliverable configurations if you're stuck with deep types. The light green area is for shallow types, and we can see this is much, much better. So if you're willing to accept a 10x overhead, then you can use all the configurations in this quad benchmark using the shallow types. We see similar results across the board. So just like type rack and reticulated was night and day, we see a night and day improvement if we switch from deep types to shallow types. Shallow avoids the worst case overheads that can show up in deep. But another thing to point out is that several of these uh, benchmark results have an inflection point on the left. When we're willing to tolerate a low overhead, deep can often run more configurations than shallow can fast enough. And the reason for that is deep doesn't pay a cost for boundaries when the program is mostly typed, and deep also gets the full benefit of optimizations. There's no shape checks to slow deep down, but shallow, in contrast, pays more for every line of typed code. With that in mind, we can recommend a new migration plan for programmers. If you're starting off with an untyped code base, begin by adding deep types to get the strongest guarantees. If you run into a performance issue, switch from deep to shallow. It's a one-line change to flip the language at the top. And then once you're in shallow types, that high performance overhead should go away. Then continue adding types using shallow until you've figured out most or all of the boundaries in the program. And then once you're back to a fully typed version of the benchmark, switch over to deep to get the best of guarantees and of performance. We've validated this migration plan using this research question. So looking at the different benchmarks that we have, we can ask, consider all the paths that go from fully untyped to fully typed in the lattice. And then for different values of D, consider what percent of these paths are de-deliverable at every step, going one by one from bottom to top. Here's a table where we looked at three deliverable paths. Okay, so again, the question is whether every point along the way is at most 3x slower than untyped. We have a few benchmarks here. The middle column shows the percent of three deliverable paths if you're stuck using either deep or shallow. And the right column shows what you can get when you can flip back and forth between deep and shallow. In the middle, we see lots of zeros. If you're sticking with deep types, you probably get stuck somewhere in the middle of the lattice. There's lots of boundaries and there's a high cost for those. Then with shallow types, you tend to get stuck towards the top. When the program is fully typed, it has the highest overhead from shallow types, and that pushes it over the three deliverable limit. So clearly we want both. We want to go back and forth between deep and shallow. And we see that in all but one of the benchmarks, we can use over half of the paths, or at least half of the paths. But even that 12x row for suffix tree is a huge improvement over what we have. So before there were no ways to navigate the lattice, and now we can ask a new research question, which is how do we identify those paths that do meet the through rule limit, and how do we direct a programmer towards those? So deep and shallow is a much better place to be. And another question that we used to validate was to look at, look at every configuration, look at that two to the n space. For each one of those, which configurations run fastest with a mix of deep and shallow, as opposed to running with purely deep or purely shallow? Here are results for a few benchmarks. And 
surprisingly, we see that for all but one, over at least one quarter of all the configurations were fastest running with a combination of deep and shallow. So that, that says that there are lots of opportunities where mixing deep and shallow together in the same program is the best of all worlds. It could be that you have some code that's typed and some that's untyped. Maybe you want shallow types at the boundary to untyped, and then deep types for everything else. But this is exciting to go forth and explore. What are the patterns that work best with deep and shallow? And how do we best take advantage of this new expressiveness? That concludes my defense of the thesis. So we have seen that deep and shallow types can work together by combining the natural and transient semantics. And again, the deep types remain deep. They still satisfy complete monitoring. And the shallow types remain type sound. And we've seen that you can use these types to strengthen shallow guarantees, avoid unimportant errors, and above all, get better performance. I want to leave you with my contributions. So these are the four main research contributions that sit inside the dissertation. Contribution number one was the systematic method to measure performance. Contribution two was the new formal properties to make sense of the design space. Number three, you can read about in the dissertation. We had to do significant work to scale up the transient semantics to handle additional types and additional expressions that appear in typed racket. And then contribution four, as we've seen, is that mixing deep and shallow is where you want to be. And that's the end. Normally we would take questions from the audience, but there is no audience. I do have some extra slides though, so I will go over those and hopefully they answer any questions that you might have. First, let's look back at this table of formal properties. We have the five properties on the left, those are the rows, and we have six semantics at the top for the columns. Let me say a few words about what each semantics does. So a natural is uh, what we saw in the model. When a number goes across a natural boundary, there's a check for a number. When a pair goes across a natural boundary, natural traverses both sides to make sure that it matches the type. And when a function hits a natural boundary, natural creates a wrapper to validate the function's behavior later on. C is for conatural. This is a lazy version of natural. And when we developed this, we were thinking about final algebra semantics. That's where the name co comes from. The only difference between co-natural and natural comes with pairs. When a pair hits a co-natural boundary, we make a wrapper for the pair. Then later on, when, when co-natural code accesses the pair, then there's later on a check, a lazy check, to see that the pair's elements match the boundary type. F is for forgetful. So compared to natural, when a function crosses multiple boundaries in natural, it gets multiple wrappers. Each time there's a new wrapper to enforce the potentially new type that we assign to the function. With forgetful, the function gets at most two wrappers. So anything that lies in between as you go back and forth gets dropped. You have just enough wrappers to enforce type soundness, but nothing more. Uh, but also you can see there's a performance benefit to forgetful. If you can drop these layers of wrappers, then you have a lower allocation and indirection cost later on. Okay, so forgetful forgets higher order obligations. Transient is our strategy that does the spot checks. When a number crosses a transient boundary, there's a check that it's a number. When a pair crosses a transient boundary, there's a check that it's a pair, but nothing more. Later on, if type code reads from the pair, there'll be another shape check. And when a function crosses a transient boundary, there's a check that it's a function. But again, nothing deeper. If the function gets called in type code, there'll be another shape check, but otherwise nothing. A is for amnesic. This is a twist on forgetful and transient. Amnesic uses wrappers, but it does exactly the same runtime checks as the transient semantics. And finally, E is for erasure. And then no matter what crosses a boundary in erasure, there is no check. In the type soundness row, we have a green check mark for every language that, is, every language that enforces full types. So if you have a green check, it says, given an expression with a surface type tau, if that expression runs to a value, I am guaranteed that that value matches type tau in the evaluation language. There's a small y for transient because it is type sound, but it's a weaker soundness guarantee. If my expression has type tau and transient, 
and I run it to get a value, I know that it has the same top level shape as type tau, but I don't know anything right here about the deeper structure. And then E for erasure has an X in the type sound as mark because types have no predictive power. Erasure has well-defined semantics, but if you have an expression of type tau and you reduce it to a value, all you know is that you have a well-formed value. The surface type says nothing to predict what kind of value it is. The complete monitoring row is pretty cut and dry. Natural and transient enforce full type obligations, and they're the only two that satisfy complete monitoring. All the rest drop certain obligations, and that's why they fail the property. Blame soundness was the question of whether, when a language reports a boundary error, does it get a subset of the truly responsible boundaries? For the semantics satisfy blame soundness. Transient has an H because it, it transient fails our standard notion of blame soundness. But if we weaken the idea of who's the responsible parties to something that's more heap-based instead of path-based then transient is blame sound with that much weaker perspective. Check out chapter four of the dissertation if you want to see the details on heap-based blame soundness and how it differs from the other. And then lastly, erasure has a zero in the blame soundness column because it's technically sound, but it's trivially sound. When erasure reports an error, it blames zero boundaries. The empty set is technically a subset of the truly responsible boundaries, but it's also zero information, so that's why we have a zero. And blame completeness. Both transient and erasure fail the completeness property. Blame completeness asks, when you report a boundary error, do you get a superset of the responsible parties? And it turns out, even if we weaken the responsible to, to talk about heap, heap-based blame completeness, transient still fails that. It'll still miss certain responsible parties. So again, ch chapter four of the dissertation if you'd like to see the details. And finally, the error preorder gives us a more or less linear order of all the semantics. So natural lies below co-natural, which lies below forgetful, which lies below transient. Transient is exactly equal to amnesic on the preorder, and both of those lie below erasure. So what this means for one example if we look at co-natural and natural, there are example programs where co-natural will not detect an error, but natural, natural will report a type mismatch. And this can show up for a pair crossing a boundary. Co-natural lazily wraps the pair, and so it can miss some errors, but natural will eagerly check and will catch those things. All right, that's the full story behind the table. A little more now on the optimizations. I said that pair and dead code can't be reused in shallow type dragon. The reason for pair is that there are some accessors that go through sequences of pairs. So if you say C-A-A-R in type dragon, then that gets the first element of the first element of a pair. With deep types, that's just fine. If, uh, if the call to that function was type correct, then you know that you have pairs all the way down so it can be optimized to use unsafe accessors. With shallow types, that's not true. You can trust the outermost pair, but you need a shape check for anything that comes out of it. So that's the reason why shallow can't reuse the entire pair pass. It does reuse other parts of it, though. For dead code, we're looking at eliminating an if branch or eliminating part of a multi-case function. This elimination needs full types to operate, and so that's why transient or shallow type bracket can't reuse any of the dead code pass. Before we saw performance results in terms of overhead plots on different benchmarks, and we saw that deep and shallow were night and day. Deep often had a few configurations that were deliverable, and shallow had many more. But another question you can ask is, what's the worst case for deep and what's the worst case for shallow? And that's what this table answers. The middle column shows the absolute worst overhead we saw on these benchmarks for the deep, uh, deep types, and the right-hand column is the worst case for shallow types. We can see deep is always in double digits on these, and shallow is always underneath double digits, so it's an order of magnitude improvement. On some of the other benchmarks, the gap is even wider, so deep has three digits or four digits of slowdown, and shallow is still under 10x. So that's another perspective on worst cases. Our implementation of shallow does not include blame. If you go back to the original paper on transient, that's by Vitusik, Swords, and Seek in Popple 2017. 
they also introduce a blame algorithm. So they have a way of saying, if something goes wrong in a transient program, here's how we blame a, a set of boundaries that might be responsible. We evaluated this algorithm in the design space analysis, and that's how we get the, the blame soundness and completeness results for transient. But the implementation of shallow racket does not come with blame out of the box. And the reason for that is we found the cost, performance cost, was overwhelmingly slow. The table shows what we learned. The middle column is the middle column is the overhead of shallow blame on the fully typed version of the benchmark. The right-hand column is the absolute worst case of deep types over all two to the n configurations in the benchmark. And this is quite shocking. So shallow is always worse than the worst case of deep when blame is turned on, and in some cases it's significantly worse. Uh, Civ is very interesting. We ran all these programs with a generous 10 minute timeout. Civ ran out of memory. It took so much space uh, accounting for the blame that the program, the process got killed. So what is going on? Well, if you look back at the Popple 2017 paper, you can, you can clearly see that the blame algorithm takes an unbounded amount of space. It keeps a global map on the side with blame information, and that associates values to boundaries that they crossed. So when you have a program with lots and lots of values and lots and lots of boundary crossings, the blame map just keeps growing. I believe that's what explains the cost that we see here. We could do further engineering on our implementation of shallow blame, and it's possible that we can reduce those numbers that you're seeing in the middle column, but the linear cost is not going to go away. We need a different blame algorithm to do that. And uh, to validate this result, I ported the sieve benchmark over from typed racket to reticulated Python. Again, back to the Popple 17, they reported fairly, fairly good results for blame. I think it was no worse than a 10x slowdown, and we're seeing things that are way worse than 10x. So I brought sieve over to reticulated Python and tried running that. And it turns out reticulated is just as bad on the sieve benchmark. We also see a tremendous slowdown, and it's because of the linear size of this map. If you go to chapter chapter five of the dissertation, I have a few more comments about the gap between reticulated blame conclusions and our blame conclusions. Uh, to summarize, reticulated used smaller benchmarks, and it also has this dynamic type which lets it avoid certain blame checks. So I think this high cost of blame is inevitable. I would say if you're interested in the shallow semantics, use it without blame and make sure you can interoperate with deep because then if you need to debug a program, you can just flip over to the deep types. Before when discussing the implementation, I said that shallow can run almost all type correct programs. I have two examples here of programs that can't run. And again, to be clear, deep types also reject the programs. Our first example uses universal types. Uh, the top expression says, import the function cutter and give it the type for all a, type a. Next, we instantiate cutter with type string, filling in the a. And then finally, since we have a string, we call a string function, string length on it. So this program is all type correct. It, it'll type check. But we can't run it using shallow types because we don't know how to enforce how to enforce type instantiation. The trouble is that filling in that all a with the type string changes the shape that we, we expect. There should be a runtime check outside of the inst, but unfortunately, instantiation is a type level operation. So th there's nothing sitting in the expanded syntax that gives us a hook to add a transient shape check. If we could add that kind of check in the future, then in the middle line, we would check for a string and this program could run safely. But for now, we have no way to insert the checks. And then problem two deals with occurrence types. Here we import the function values, and we give it this occurrence function type, which says values takes in anything, returns anything. And if it happens to return a not false result, then we can infer that the input was a string. Next, we have x, which is type any value 0 and we call values on x. When the call returns true, then the type system can infer that x was a string, and so that refines the type inside the then branch. That refinement is trouble for transient, trouble for shallow. We need to do a shape check before we enter the then branch, 
and the shape check needs to confirm everything we learned with these occurrence type predicates. But again, right now, there's no, there's no runtime syntax sitting there that corresponds to what we learned. Occurrence types are a kind of side channel. So in the future, we would need some way of recording what did we learn from the if test, and then putting that into a runtime check to guard the then branch, and also if we learned information for the else branch to guard that one as well. The picture here shows the boundary checks that we wound up with for our model. If you go to chapter seven of the dissertation, you can see our attempts to optimize. So I have some discussion about whether or not the deep shallow boundary could be weakened to not have wrappers around it. The answer seems like no, we would need a very aggressive static analysis. But if shallow is allowed to create wrappers, there are some opportunities here. So again, check out chapter seven of the dissertation if you're interested. And finally, in addition to removing unimportant errors, switching from deep to shallow can sometimes give simpler behavior. And that's because deep creates wrappers. These wrappers sometimes change, change what a program does. And shallow never creates wrappers, so there is no change. Here's an example, and this one is also thanks to John Clements on the mailing list. In the beginning, we have untyped code. We call the list function index of. We give it a list a, b, and the symbol a. Index of searches the list for an element that matches. And with our untyped program, it returns position zero because the first element of the list matches the symbol a. To switch over to deep types, we need to give a type annotation for index of. The natural thing to do is to give it a polymorphic type for all list of t and all arguments that have type t, index of will search and possibly return a number. You'll get a number for the position if the element is found and a false otherwise. We call index of on the list a, b and the symbol a, and now instead of position zero, we get back false as the result. And what's happened here is to enforce that type at the boundary to untyped index of, deep creates a wrapper. The wrapper messes up the equality comparison. Now we have a different behavior, false. If we switch to shallow though, there's no wrapper to get in the way. There are just those shape checks and typed code. And so we get the same result, position zero, as before. No wrappers, fewer surprises. And with that, that's the end of my Q&A slides. So thank you all for listening, and goodbye for now.